Recently, I deleted Reddit from my phone and found myself with a whole bunch of spare time. Rather than doom scrolling, I figured I'd do little bits of research whenever I had the opportunity. And something I've been looking into recently has been memory allocation algorithms. In most of programming, it's easy enough to basically use malloc and free in order to handle memory. But um, this is sort of wasteful. The thing with malloc, memory allocate, is when we call malloc in C or C++, when we call, you know, new in um, C++ or any of these functions, basically, what they do is they jump down to the operating system and they say, hey, I want this many bytes of memory. Can you give it to me? Can I use it? And this is a, a fully generic problem. The operating system doesn't know how long we're going to be using this thing for. It doesn't know a lot. It doesn't know much about it. And in order to solve the fully generic problem of memory allocation, a lot of machinery is used under the hood. The upshot of this is that dynamic memory allocation can be very expensive. Malloc is fine, but it has an overhead, and if the problem doesn't need fully dynamic memory allocation, it's probably not... What I'm saying is it's probably not a good idea to call malloc to allocate a string, for instance. How does memory allocation work? Well, first of all, we need to understand, like, what is memory? Memory, of course, is referred to by a pointer, but all memory is is it's a region of RAM or something. It's a region somewhere which is guaranteed to not be written to by anything else. When we perform memory allocation, we imagine that our memory is it's like a big flat map. We sort of could just do a memory shotgun and pick a random hexadecimal address, hope it's not too big, and just write to it and read from it, but there's a pretty good chance that it will be in use. On the other hand, what we could do is we could allocate a really big chunk of memory, either on the stack or the heap, it actually doesn't really matter, but just for our purposes, we'll just say it's on the heap, like we've malloced a whole bunch of memory at the beginning of the program, and then keep track of sort of the, the current position that's being used within that memory. So let's say that this is, actually for simplicity, I'll just call this byte number zero. So the first time that, that some memory is requested, we could have some class or static variable or something to track where we are in this chunk. The first time memory is requested, we can return that. And then the allocation will be some certain size. And then, you know, let's say, for instance, this is 16 bytes worth of memory. Then that um, pointer would increase. That offset would increase to a size of 16. And then let's say, you know, we allocate some memory. And we sort of return that address back. Then let's say that's four bytes and then an allocation of two bytes occurs. So this would go up to 22 also. And under the hood, the contents of this array of bytes would be used by different parts of the program to store different memory and, and do different operations and things. So, you know, all, all this um, region here is being used for various things, but it's independent of this region here because that's sort of the guarantee that we're imposing. But there's a problem with this. This is fine if we're never going to free this memory. But when we go ahead and free like this chunk here, we don't really have at the moment in our scheme, we don't really have a way for this pointer to go back to 16 and to know that, hey, but the span between 16 and 20 is now free. So if we were to keep going, you know, let's say we, we allocate another... Um, eight bytes or something, so the pointer goes up to 30, but then we have this region here, which is unused. And this is what's called memory fragmentation. This is not good. This has just been a fully, fully naive situation, but this is an example of memory allocation. Now I'm going to 
stop waffling and make this actually a lot more structured. So there's a bunch of different memory allocation policies we can have. One is what's called a pool or a fixed size policy. And what that is, is we basically have, hey, um, I expect that there's going to be a whole bunch of these things that I might need. Let's say each of these is one megabyte. Okay, so we have some pool object which stores a whole bunch of one megabyte allocations. Um, they could be separate arrays or they could just be like, I don't know, a six, for instance, a 16 megabyte allocation with one megabyte regions within that. And when we request one, we just, you know, get the next available allocation, return a pointer to that allocation, and then increase the the indicator you know so that next time we request a chunk of memory it points to another one and just keep going like that now this has the benefit that it's really really simple we're going to pretend that no memory fragmentation exists so that, like for instance when a megabyte of memory is allocated the code which is using that will never need to um, split that into sections. It'll never need to, well, it will free the memory. We can handle that, but it won't need to use just a part of the memory. Or if it does use a part of the memory, we're going to eat that loss and say, well, that's wasted space, but we don't need to worry about fragmentation. So actually, Vulkan uses pools whenever it has to allocate things at runtime. And this is a way of avoiding dynamic memory allocation. It's a way of avoiding malloc, basically, because pool memory allocation is probably the fastest. You can allocate a whole bunch of, you know, elements of the pool up front. And in that case, it sort of costs almost nothing to get a new element. Um, another allocation policy we could have is linear. And the way this works is I would class it as sort of one level above pool allocation in the sense that it's still really quick, not as quick, to allocate memory. But the memory allocations can be various sizes. So let's say we start off with a whole thing, a whole allocation, which has not been used at all. It's free. Like... 300 megabytes, who cares, like a really big number. And we have some sort of header up the front, which just keeps track of how much memory is available and the location of that memory. And then let's say we allocate, I don't know, three megabytes, doesn't matter, some, some amount. So what happens is we fetch this, you know, we, we, we step in here and say, okay, is this allocation free available? Yes, it is. Okay, let's carve off three megabytes worth of memory, then return the location to the beginning of that memory chunk, and also construct a new header. And then these headers are going to be like a linked list. We could even make them, yeah, let's make them a doubly linked list. So this header here has no previous element, but it does have a, a next element. This header here has a previous element. It doesn't have a next element and so on and so on. So let me just write out a bunch of these little allocations, something like this. Okay, so we formed a doubly linked list. Every one of these headers knows how large its allocation is. It knows what its previous header is and it knows what its next header is. And we could store a boolean to track whether that memory to the right of this header is available for further allocation, or we could simply implicitly store that in the size. So we could make the size a signed integer and like a negative number means the allocation is taken and a positive number means it isn't. I don't know, that's, that's one approach, however you want to do it. Then the question is, okay, how do we allocate? Well, what we could do is, I'm just thinking, 
Yeah, so what we could do, right now it's pretty simple, we could just say R take the last element, but for instance, let's say that this element in the middle here has been freed. So what we would do, so just put a cross for free memory, what we could do is we could just take the last element, or it would be probably a nicer idea to look through the whole list, find the smallest free allocation, which is large enough to store what we're looking for. So there's a good chance we would probably reallocate this region here rather than this region on the end and possibly further subdivide this into, you know, a smaller region which is being used and then the remainder which is free to be further allocated. I know that I keep saying the word allocated. Anyway, so then, you know, when we go to free memory, we also need to do what's called coalescing, and that is an attempt to reduce fragmentation by gathering together free regions. So when I freed this memory, first up, you know, I set some flag somewhere to indicate that it's free, but then I would also look at its neighbors and say, well, are they free? In this case, they're not free, so nothing happens. But in this case, if I free this block, I set a flag to indicate that it's free, I look at the neighbor, this one is not free, this one is though. So I can actually sort of regather these into a new larger region. And this avoids issues like if I kept continually, continually calling um, allocations, and then I had a whole bunch of little allocations, and then I freed a bunch of them, but I wasn't gathering them together, then it may look as if I don't have some amount of memory available, even though if I were to coalesce that memory together, I would then have blocks which could be reused for bigger things, if that makes sense. So the reason I call this, oh, the reason this is called linear allocation is because we have to linearly step through a linked list to find available spots. On the other hand, and this is a little more complicated, but not that much more complicated, there's something called buddy allocation. And buddy allocation is simply the concept that we have this really big chunk of memory that's free for us to use, but we're going to recursively subdivide it until we get to some determined level. So imagine sort of splitting this into half and then splitting this region into half and so on and so on. So what we've got is even though these are really partitions of the original memory chunk, they are, yeah, sort of subdivided. So this is sort of a, a binary search tree pattern. And it's actually a little better than a binary search tree because it's a balanced binary search tree. And what that means is if we were to look at this, let me just give this some, some labels. So A b, c, the locations of each of these, um, the locations of each of these headers could be stored in a separate array where everything is deterministic. So we know, for instance, that the first element, element zero, is the complete high level description. And, you know, so it's like level zero, level one, and so on. So it's all based around powers of two. And so, for instance, if I wanted to allocate some small block, I would actually, based on the size of what I'm allocating, I would be able to work out sort of the level that I want to allocate at, because we want to make our allocations as small as possible, no bigger. So in this case, we would know, okay, this is level, or the other, uh, it's, probably, it's probably the other way way around actually, I think it's um, zero, one, two, three, I'm rambling, but we could, uh, given we know which level we're on, then we can deterministically calculate the region of the header array to look through. And then we can sort of, yeah, we can sort of search through that level, pick out the first location, and there we have it. Because H is being used, and H is a subset within D, 
well then now D can't really be used because the, you know, the beginning, but I can still be used. And likewise, if we look at B, now B's out of action, but all of this stuff, because it doesn't overlap with H, is available. And then likewise, you know, if this is like 200 megabytes, we use the first megabyte, well then we can't exactly use the other 200 megabytes because of the overlap, but we've still got all this other space available to us. So this is sort of, yeah, sort of the idea of a buddy system. Hopefully that makes sense. There are some other memory allocation techniques, but when you get into it, you find that they sort of blend together, like they have some overlap. Was What was the point of this video? That's a fair question. Um, for one thing, <clears throat> malloc is great, but it's an interface to the operating system, and it's a lot of heavy machinery. It, it shouldn't just be thrown around for little allocations. As a matter of fact, the bigger the, the bigger the malloc is and the less frequently it's used, the better it's going to turn out. So when I talk about custom memory allocators, it's totally valid to call malloc once at the start of the program to allocate like a really big chunk of memory and then use regions, reserve regions within that memory as needed. We can learn to program, but we're not going to be programming fully generic systems. We're going to be programming games because that's fun. And in a game, you have a restricted system and you can scale that system up for sure. Like, let's say I'm working on a linear allocator because that's a nice blend of flexible but simple. And then I just straight up, I allocate everything and I reach the end of my allocation. Well, then I can call malloc again to allocate another another chunk. So the system does scale. Um, yeah, look, I hope that makes sense. I think to use a word, I think I've coalesced that into a segment which has some meaning. I can probably edit this down, make it coherent. And yeah, I mean, here's a homework exercise. Write your own memory allocator using one of these concepts. You can always pick another one as you learn some better algorithms, but just write one. And then if you're working on a Vulkan program, try passing that in as the memory allocator for a, a struct creator. And I don't know, inspect the memory, see what happens. Have fun with it. Anyway, keep learning, keep having fun, and I will see you again soon. Bye.